We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. All right. So we're going to swap things up a bit tonight. I'm handing over my bell to Sean for him to talk about some of the games he's been checking out. Now, specifically superhero themed RPGs. And I got a couple questions for him about this. So first up, what's with you and superhero RPGs? Where'd this obsession come from? And second, what games have you checked out that caught your interest and why? So what are the, what are the most interesting ones you found? Because I know you're not going to go through all of them. We'll we be here all night and into next episode. I know it's quite a list of games. And I keep thinking, I'm like, how many ways can you do role-playing of superheroes differently? Like, I know of a few core systems, but what makes these games stand out as unique from one another? Well, up first, uh, you know, I started as a comic book collector very young. Uh, I was actually involved in groups of comic book collectors and, and tracking values and things. And while I got out of that uh, and my collection tanked when the entire market bottom dropped out uh, in the 90s, uh, I still have a deep love for the superhero genre and comic book mm. themes and the way comic books present things and, and tell stories. Um, I, comic books are just a fantastic form of media and have so much value, not only in the super sense, but I know, like, I was introduced to some great works of uh, classical fiction through comic books. Uh, my first ever experience with Ivanhoe was in comic book form. Uh, and it was a great introduction, whereas the book, when I was, you know, eight years old, probably would not have done anything for me, uh, despite the fact that my parents were very literary and I read Hamlet at a far too early age. Uh, but uh, thanks to many sales and some digging into free or pay what you want titles, I've really been delving into my love for supers and in the uh, RPGs as of late. There are so many to talk about that work in so very many different ways. Now, we've mentioned this on our show before, I think in one of our suggestions not too long ago, but one of the biggest trouble tr struggles in managing superheroes at the table is relative power. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two main methods that games use of handling this. One, limit your scope. Uh, if you're playing with a group of supers, make sure they're all about the same strength, and then you can keep your foes balanced in relation to that strength level of your superheroes. Um, and if something is just, you know, colossally high versus your group, you don't roll for it. It just happens. If something is colossally low, you don't roll for it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, it, whatever. Uh, that's the easy solution and, and keeps things sort of all, all crunched in together. Right. The other option is the crunchy solution. <laughs> Cover everything. Make sure every available possibility is allowed for. Uh, this is often charts and stats with mathematical progressions, but not always. You still need to have an answer for what happens when a street thug and Galactus the World Devourer mm -hmm. go head to head. And and those are where the uh, the super crunchy ones come in. Yeah, I know there was definitely a trend in the old days that every superhero RPG published was trying to do all the things. Yeah. In every one, they wanted you to be able to play Superman or Spider-Man. And yes, I'm mashing, mashing my <laughs> genres on, on purpose. Even Spider-Man's pretty power. You should be able to play Aunt May in Superman. Absolutely. And, yeah. and that was definitely a, the trend back when I used to play superheroes yep. RPGs. So just really short background on my history of super. So I, you know I'm interacting with some authority. <laughs> uh, my first ever role-playing game I ever played was TSR's Marvel Superheroes. That got me started. And I think that did a lot to mold what I like in RPGs from then going forward. I never grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons with hit points and Thacko and none of that existed. I went from Marvel to um, Ghostbusters and then from Ghostbusters to Warhammer. So I, I'm more of a fan of D100 based systems than I'll ever be of D20 systems. And, but back then I tried the DC hero. I tried the Marvel superheroes. I remember trying um, the uh, Palladium one. There was a Palladium Super yes, Super. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, it's, it's, I didn't own that one. I tried that one. I wasn't a big fan of Palladium. That one didn't try me over. But all of them back then were trying to be all the things. They yes. they wanted you to be able to do the the galactic cosmic battle and do the street stuff all in the same game, possibly at the same time. And and that comes from the content, right? So if you're looking at Marvel, Marvel has Superman and Jimmy Olsen and they want to give you that experience that you get in their comic books. 
Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you move into some of the smaller imprints, uh, some of the comic worlds and universes are a little more narrow uh, and don't necessarily represent that full range of, of cosmic to, to street. Yeah. I think in general, as time has gone on, more RPG designers have found out how valuable it is to narrow their focus. Absolutely. Now, I said there were two methods, but really okay. there is a third option, which is really what our first game does, and that's ignore the ignore it completely. That's right. Who cares if person A is weak and person B is strong? It all comes out in the narrative, and the mechanics are just a matter of hit or miss, in the, and, and everything else is done in the narrative. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It's always fascinating to see how different role-playing games handle the same genre, whether that's fantasy, sci-fi, history, investigation. I am really looking forward to that. Each, each game does something different, sometimes a little different, and sometimes in completely new ways. I, I am looking to hear about the variety of supers RPG mechanics out there. All right, well, first up, it's one we've mentioned many times, of course, and that is Masks, a new generation from Magpie Games. It is a Powered by the Apocalypse game that is really sort of the top of the heat in narrative superhero gaming these days. Mm -hmm. It's a very flexible system with a huge range of character design potential included in going by playbooks, which are mm -hmm. their, their uh, set of, of tools to build a character. Everyone gets, gets dropped into one playbook or another um, and moves on from there. But it's not without its problems for some people. Uh, it is a system that is specifically designed to play as young heroes mm -hmm. where adults have influ are, are important to you. Adults have influence over you as automatic and emotions are the wild and shifting aspect of what's going on. Uh, you don't take damage, you take emotional damage. Now, personally, I played this one. I've had a ton of fun with it. Uh, way more than I thought. Um, I, I didn't think I'd enjoy teen drama in my RPGs. But I did love Young Justice, which is the comic DC Comics cartoon that was a big inspiration for this game. And I, the game I played, I had an amazing DM, in, uh, or whatever the DM's called in that system, <laughs> Master of Ceremonies, whatever they use, in Phil Vecchione, and, well, a table of um, who's who's, right? Uh, the the Mr. Rector Mark fans, like the Were Gator, Schmitty, Senda, all at the same table. And I had a great time playing Mass. And here I was like, uh, we went to prom. <laughs> like... Like, I'll admit, I went to two proms in real life, but I didn't, I kind of did it because that's what you were expected to do, <laughs> not because I really wanted to go to prom. So that was interesting. Yeah, and, and Mask is really all about the setting and the world you're immersed in. So the GM makes a massive difference in setting the tone, mm -hmm. especially for one-offs. Uh, Magpie actually offers paid sessions with professional GMs uh, that work with Magpie to build uh, sessions at $12 a session for, for several of their games, it's... masks included. Um, I've actually been really tempted to jump in uh, on a session and, and get a feel for how a pro, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, a pro is running uh, the game just as a way to help build up my skill base for, uh, for running the game. And to be honest, $12 for an oh. RPG session, that's yeah, nothing. That's nothing. Yeah. And I would say they're definitely pros. They're getting paid for it. Yeah. Now, one of the things I want to do before we go forward, you mentioned this was a Powered by the Apocalypse game. And I know what that means. And I think most people listening know, but there may be some listeners or viewers that have no idea what Powered by the Apocalypse means. So Masks is one of a number new modern role-playing games that are based on the mechanics of a specific game called Apocalypse World, which was designed by Vincent McGay Baker. When the Bakers released Apocalypse World, it took the indie RPG world by storm, for good or bad. And along with it, they replay, released the Apocalypse Engine to the public for other creatives to use and modify as they like, as long as you let the original designers know and got their permission to use the license. Now, there's no money. You didn't have to pay them to use it. But basically, they wanted the ability to veto games, especially if someone wanted to take their system and put out some problematic content. They could say, no, we don't support this game. I so what happened is a ton of these games came out mass being one of them and games created using the apocalypse engine are generally called powered by the apocalypse or pbta games you will hear about other pbta games tonight and that was masks a new generation from magpie games now next up 
from Green Ronin is what might be the complete opposite experience in Mutants and Masterminds. <laughs> this is uh, sort of the king of the hill for a more classic style super RPG, and it's not afraid to show it. Uh, frankly, most people, myself included, are stymie before they manage to get through character creation. Uh, it is crunchy. Very crunchy. Uh, it's all about power levels and spending points and points spent on these stats affect points uh, that are calculated in these stats combined with points that are also spent on those stats. And you've got very different attack and defense stats. And that's all before you even get into spending points on skills and powers. Um, <laughs> it, it Just defining your basic stats and trying to, to squeeze yourself into uh, a power level, which is how they describe their, their games. While, while they do cover everything from Galactus to Jimmy Olsen, uh, they do recommend that teams work uh, within a certain power range, mostly mm -hmm. because you want your team to work well together and you don't want the one guy going up and doing everything while everyone else stands back and has a, has a smoke watch and, you know, <laughs> Superman clean up the, the bad guys. Um, but as a result, it gets very crunchy. Now, I'm repeatedly told by fans of the system that once you make it through character creation, <laughs> it's pretty smooth. But I have doubts. Um, realistically, I think with the, the struggle I've had just uh, trying to barrel through reading it on my own, I need to sit down at a table with a knowledgeable GM running for me or uh, watch enough APs, uh, even though I own the player's guide and the GM's guide and, and have been reading them. Uh, Mutants and Masterminds definitely has a reputation for crunch, and it sounds like it stands up to that reputation. This was one I never got into. Uh, I didn't do Eminem or Champions or any of the other really high crunch supers games. I liked my Universal Table and my D100 rolls. Though I would have thought, like this is the sixth edition, I think, of Mutants and Masterminds. I would have figured they would have streamlined it. And what scares me is maybe this is streamlined. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something, that's for sure. <laughs> so that was Mutants and Master Nines from Green Ronin. All right. Well, next, I'm going to shift back over to Powered by the Apocalypse, PDBTA, with Worlds in Peril from Kyle Simons at Sam Joko Publishing. Uh, this is a you know run-up to a version of Masked with Adults. And it had some real potential. I was really interested uh, reading through this and hopeful. Uh, and it's got a different system, whereas in Masks, you get a playbook. And so you are either the Bull or the Janus. And that's that, that one playbook frames your entire uh, character creation. This is actually a mix and match. Uh, so you're actually pitch, picking uh, sort of what inspired you and where you're headed to and mm -hmm. match those together to create your playbook. Um, which gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility compared to the monolithic playbooks of masks. But uh, unfortunately, after reading through it and, and, and looking at uh, some other people's experiences with it, it fell a bit short, specifically in their implementation of what masks considered influence, and this game considered bonds. Uh, in masks, if you have influence over someone, you are important to them, and it's marked on your sheet, mm -hmm. and it gives you an, a slight advantage in a role. You know, you you influence this. You, you have uh, an ability to to influence or sway this person, so you get a little better role from it. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. With bonds, it's a value, so you can have a stronger bond or a weaker bond from one to whatever, uh, infinite. Uh, and but it's marked on your sheet, and then it would also be marked on someone else's sheet if they feel they have a bond with you. But you ch spend that bond to affect roles meaning you're spending how that person feels about you as a, as a currency in the game. Mm. And it's, you know, you're essentially saying, I want to do better. So you don't like me as much. I, that's kind of strange. Yeah. Like that, that, to be honest, it just sounds like mechanics, right? This sounds like something they put in for balance and doesn't actually fit the theme, but they had to put this in to have some kind of cooperation system and they wanted some kind of economy in there. I don't know. I, it sounds like an interesting design choice. I wonder if it actually works better than it sounds. Like I've, I've definitely read enough RPGs that I read something like that. And I'm like, eh. and then I play and I'm like, 
oh okay but uh, yeah. you're saying you saw other people saying complaining about this as well, well so I, I think they wanted to do their take on influence they didn't want to just copy influence from masks and that's understandable right. because uh the influence mechanic is very much uh, a sort of an adult child relationship in the way it's handled in masks and they right. went with something different and it, it may work mechanically but the disconnect that it gives you if you actually think about what how it works is quite problematic uh and it's 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 hard to overcome the fact that you're spending how someone else feels about you um even if again as a mechanic it technically works hmm. um so uh, unfortunately in the reviews i've seen this this mechanic ends up being hacked around or keeps people completely away from the game wow. Uh, what I'm now looking forward to seeing is their follow-up, which is not based on Powered by the Apocalypse, but is actually a Forged in the Dark game. Uh, okay. And that should be arriving in backers' hands, including mine, later this year. So again, for people who don't know what Forged in the Dark means, this is another system that was derived by an independent RPG that was very popular called Blades in the Dark. And similar to uh, Apocalypse World, there's the forged in the dark system which has been released to the public as long as you give credit back to the original creators and so on sorry i didn't catch the names of that i didn't i didn't think to google the names of who made blades in the dark i don't remember off the top of my head but it's a similar deal so anything that's forged in the dark is based on the game system behind blades in the dark right and that was worlds in peril from kyle simons now, next up on the list is a fun one that Mo gave me a heads up about on itch.io, and that is Hearts and Souls from Silver Lion Studios. This is a modern narrative game, but with more than just some D6s, making it a nice blend of systems. Versus, it's a simple roll versus system, but they've used the number and type of dice in to an interesting end. Uh, sure. The size of, the, of your die is your power level whether you're human, super, or cosmic. And the number of dice is your strength within that level. So you can be a really powerful human and just have a lot of those dice or a really weak super and only have one die, but it's a bigger dice than a human has. Okay. Um, and you only need one hit to succeed. So on a task with a difficulty of three, a human might roll 3d4, a super might roll 4d8s, and Galactus might roll 5d12s. Uh, okay. But anyone who hits on a three or better on any one dice, one die, succeeds. Uh, a straightforward solution to the, that wild power level uh, issue. It's all about the difficulty you set. Yeah, I like the sound of that. That sounds mechanically solid. That sounds like a really interesting way to handle it. And I like the fact that there's still the chance the human can succeed. That's, a, that's actually a not a bad system. Yeah. And I do want to give credit. I did learn about this one through the Gauntlet podcast. So this isn't one I discovered on my own. So please take credit to the Gauntlet for this somewhat different take on supers. That was Hearts and Souls from Silverline Studios. Now, next up, I ran across an older system called Bash, with an exclamation point, from Chris Rutkowski, which is part of the Basic Action Heroes. In this case, Basic Action Superheroes, B-A-S-H. It's a relatively simple three-stat game and 2d6 exploding that, unlike many, multiply the dice result by the stat to get an outcome. Now that, I mean, this is, I don't know of any other games that I run into where you are multiplying dice by stats it's so the stats are a simple one to five scale where one is human and five is you know true superhuman uh super uh, superman basically uh mm -hmm. kryptonian level uh this same scale works for powers as well so you've got weak powers at one and strong powers at five uh it's a simple fun system and one great thing i got from the book was describing the game uh while I may never play this system, I really enjoy the concepts and I've grabbed some of their other materials related to mm -hmm. the game for inspiration and inclusion in, in my own games uh, as they publish a magazine and other supplements. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would sound solid too. Uh, again, multiplying. I, I, The only thing I can think of is DC superheroes, the original used exponents. 
and you would multiply the previous level by your level and you are always twice as good as the one under but like even that's different yeah that's not it's not the same as multiplying your your stat modifier to based on your ability or whatever your skill yeah and i mean like a 2d6 exploding yeah multiplied that's you. By, you can get some really high numbers there yeah, so i would think so you it's again it's really possible to get some massive numbers and weak people can really succeed because of that exploding uh just this week on twitter actually uh the, a discussion came up about supers and a few people were saying you know a real super game has to have exploding dice because it, it does allow that possibility of anyone being able to, to succeed uh based on you know the luck of the roll basically so these exploding dice are they versus a difficulty number is it like dm sets a difficulty and you're yeah. trying to beat it yeah, yeah. it's all difficulty okay. Sounds cool. I, yeah. This definitely looks interesting. Mm -hmm. That was Bash, B-A-S-H, from Chris Rut Rutkowski. Right. And now we're going to move on to uh, another old game, but not only old game, but old school style. Mm. Uh, literally with the official D20 system called Silver Age Sentinels, the ultimate D20 superhero <laughs> RPG from Guardians of Order, Inc. Now, this is a D20 open license from WotC as applied to supers. Now, this one caught my eye because I'm a huge fan of the Silver Age. I like my heroes to be heroic, not dark and brooding. <laughs> now, among other things in this sizable 300 plus page rule book, there is a fantastic overview of both comic book history, but also superhero RPG history, That's cool. uh, which I may or may not be using as a checklist at some point. <laughs> um, now, this is only up until it was published and the game's a little older. I believe it's a 2003 uh, copyright on this one, but still, you know, there's, there's been quite a few games up to that point. Mm -hmm. Now, as one might expect, this runs much like most D20 games. <laughs> the sheer size of the rule book is so that you have options available to cover the various rules and needs in order to play out, you know, the D to, in the D20 style, but it doesn't really add to the crunch at all. If you don't want it to, the designers have even added a simple one page summary on page one of the GM section <laughs> that cuts through everything in the previous 168 pages and distills the game down into a list of you need to pay attention to this, 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 and this. And if you want to ignore this, 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 and this, <laughs> uh, for when you're just looking for a fast and loose supers RPG. And I thought that was a fantastic add in, uh, for the game. Yeah. Now, one thing I know, however, in my overview of the book, this is not a modern narrative RPG written mm. with care and concern. And I feel pretty confident in saying that in 2002, when this was written, they didn't hire sensitivity consultants. Mm. Now the silver age was far from perfect. And many of the tropes and stereotypes from that age are understood now to simply not be okay. But acknowledging them is one thing, including them in your settings and system is another. Mm. And while I think this system as a mechanical way of playing has some real strengths. You can't really ignore some of the problems uh, that pop up throughout the book in story and setting. Fair. I got to admit, as soon as I heard D20 supers, I was like, oh, why, why does everyone have to cram every genre and setting into D and D like D and D does its own thing and does it well for what it is. But that doesn't mean you should use the system for every single game out there. You're welcome, Jeff. <laughs> I own a D20 version of Judge Dredd, a D20 version of Star Wars, even a Battle on 5 D20 system, and none of them really do the setting justice. Now, I'll admit I was convinced the Star Wars was pretty good until I saw some more modern Star Wars <laughs> games and then tried the oldest Star Wars game and found both to be better. Now... The one thing I didn't see in my D20 games was any of this problematic content, uh, though I'm sure Judge Dredd does have some in there uh, based on the theme of that setting. But I, I just, I don't know. It always feels like the designers are fighting to get the system to work for them in this case. And, and I'm, I'm going to mention this again later in our review section, actually, this kind of comes up. And it just, ah, the D20, why? Everyone's obsessed with the D20 system. Now, I don't thing, get it. The one thing I will say is the, the concept of magic and superpowers yeah. do actually overlap and overlay into uh, a reasonable method. So there there is in some ways in superheroes a little bit more op uh, opportunity yeah, to guess. use this system. But again, as we're showing in this episode, there are a lot of systems out there. And yeah. unless you're a diehard D20 fan, 
this one might not be equal. yeah I, I and you know what teach your own if you enjoy playing d20 feel free i That's personally cool. find it I don't know. Like I said, it's, it feels forced whenever they take these extra settings and turn them into the D&D system. Yeah. But if you enjoy it, if you love Super Age Sentinels, do your own thing. That's <laughs> This is my opinion. You're welcome to your own. Yep. That was Silver Age Sentinels, the ultimate D20 superhero RPG from Guardians of Order, which also implies there are other D20 superhero RPGs. Now, next up is one that I should have known better about. <laughs> David Oakham who is a fantastic artist and paper mm -hmm. miniature designer. Well, he came out with Save the Day, a superhero role-playing game. And I've got that uh, just right up behind me there. Uh, but as one might expect, if, unlike me, they thought about who the designer was, <laughs> uh, it is very much a tabletop mini game with area of effect cones and charts galore. <laughs> now, frankly, I don't like minis in my RPGs. This is me. I... It's just not my thing, even in a world mm -hmm. without pandemics. But what I will say is, even if you don't like this style of game, the art that he puts forth mm -hmm. in this book is a true delight. A fun, uh, silver and golden age feel style characters with the thick line style he's got for that are made mm -hmm. for cutting out uh, in all of his style. And so even, even if I will probably never, ever play this game, I'm not at all sad that I have it in the hardcover and can flip through and just enjoy what it is for a work of art. So it can, it is full RPG or is it just like a skirmish game? No, no, it's, it's, a, it's RPG it's a, with, but, but heavily on the, heavily, on the yeah, heavily leading to yeah, the yeah. tactical combat system. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I am a personal fan of David Oakham, fellow Canadian. I, I've been following his work since the G plus days and saw him evolve to that. Like you say, he's got this very, thick black line on the outside for cutting out his paper miniatures because that's his main main thing is bread and butter are paper miniatures and he was one of the first people to do them like before you could get standees from pathfinder even so yeah big fan of david oakham's work but i'm not surprised it's it's all about minis and presentation with david if you ever see shots of his home games it's beautiful terrain with all his paper minis on it i i am impressed by his work but I, I definitely not surprised to hear <laughs> that he, he wrote a superhero miniature game with role-playing elements. Yep. And that was Save the Day by David Oakham. Now, next, we're going to take a look at an interesting take on a super game. This is from Re Anselmo, created for Beyond the Super Jam on itch.io. Now, this takes the standard supers game and twists it into a reality TV show <laughs> where the GM, sorry, the host is working with a new team of supers who have camera drones following them 24-7. And even more strangely for an RPG, there is a winner. Huh. That's right. Whoever has the highest popularity at the end of the season gets a contract, action figure, and millions of dollars. Nice. In-game. The player just oh. gets dirty looks from everyone else. <laughs> Honestly, this screams con game in some ways. Yeah. And a fun one at that that's introducing interplayer competition as well as a need to cooperate to deal with villains, crimes, etc. Uh, no, I should point out it is designed to play as a campaign game okay. to play out a full season of episodes. Um, and I think it would really suit a lot of online play as not all the players need to be there for every episode. Uh, and players could be featured um, uh, on episodes and everyone, you know, everyone gets two episodes as them with them as the feature character sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is an use of dice. So the DM is always rolling for your opposition with a dice pool built up of a, of a variety of different dice based on the threats present in each encounter. It's it's a little tricky to grasp at first as you're reading through it, but for the right group, I think this game really has some amazing potential. That DM, sorry, what was it called? The host rule for the, the pool of dice, the pool of threats really reminds me of Marvel Heroic Roleplaying, where I actually went out and bought a set of red dice in all the different sizes, so my pool was always red so people could see it. Yeah. One thing I thought of here when you said that about playing online, does because it's a TV show, is there an audience? Uh, and does that impact it? Well, the audience is it really only exists in the popularity sort of score oh, okay. you get. Because all I'm thinking is stream that on Twitch where you have an audience. 
I it's and I'm just thinking you could definitely tie something in there. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure you could, you know, with voting and, and bits or whatever, you know, yeah, you exactly. Can, you can absolutely. Uh, with with very little hacking, uh, turn this into a stream. Oh, game. that sounds fantastic. Actually, the game in general sounds really cool. I actually used to run an older game system called Dream Park based on the novels, but I threw out the novels and the whole you're playing a character. But I kept the whole you're playing a character who's playing a character and you were playing a character on an ongoing TV series slash game show. Now, we didn't have winners, but we did have things like audience interactions. So the players would do something and I would tell them what the feedback was at the time. There was no internet at the time I was running that. Well, there probably was an internet, but not like we have now. Um, but I would like, like uh, there was a live studio audience. So like I'd start clapping when they'd be doing something or I'd start hooting or whatever. And I, I loved running that game and the players loved it. And it's cool to see that being done by someone else so i'm not the only one that came up with this <laughs> but they're doing it with supers which is really cool where we did literally anything because it was dream park so players could make whatever they wanted and they could change it up between shows so you get the same actor playing a different character every time which fit the season well but seeing that applied to superheroes sounds really neat absolutely and i think you know what now that you've got me thinking about it this would actually be a fantastic way where if you had a host um you could also have narrators so you actually get, yeah so you, I, I would actually love to go to a meta level. So you've got basically a stream doing the RPG that is streamed to another str uh, stream where you've got two people talking about what's going on. And oh, commentary. Co doing commentary and, and narrating over and, and over the whole game wow. as it's played. Uh, and that would be the stream you'd send people to watch. Um, or they could choose. <laughs> or, they, or they could choose, obviously. Right. Um, and, and just sort of, you know, have that, you know, call it because those people could be calling out to the audience while mm -hmm. the players and the narrator didn't directly address the audience at all. Uh, they knew they were there, but didn't, right. you know, they were busy fighting crime or, or whatever was going on. Yeah. There's, a, a, there's definite potential there. Yeah. And that was beyond the super jam from re and Selmo. Now, I think I'm going to wrap up with one of the most different super RPGs in my collection, and that is <laughs> Spectaculars from Scratchpad Publishing. And that, that's the, the, big, the big box right there up over my shoulder. Okay. Uh, this is a card and dice system that caught my eye immediately when I saw someone mentioning it on Twitter. Uh, they were actually mentioning that it was hard to get because uh, at the time during the pandemic, the, the publishers were shifting warehouses. Mm -hmm. um and they'd been asking about it and and i looked into it and uh within a day i ordered it myself um so in addition to dice and cards they use tear off pads like you'd use for scoring in many board games but these are both for your character sheet um yeah. and that's character sheet in quotes <laughs> and for what they call series or the the published scenarios in a adventures sort of so the game almost feels like a deck builder with how much stuff you get in it. You got 290 cards, 22 dice, 60 tokens, and game trays. That's trays with a Z. Plastic. Well, the branded game trays. Game yeah, trays. Yeah, game oh. trays for each player. Now, another board game-like aspect of this is every time you sit down, you can swap around players, characters, or even who the GM mm. is, uh, which they call narrator, as there is no hidden information. Mm. So... I think my favorite line from the 60 page included rule book, which is the full size of the box. Uh, it's not like a little rule book. No, this is mm. 60 pages of double column wow. full size book uh, is it is a good idea to have at least one player read the rule book, <laughs> which indicates that you actually don't have to read the rules to get yourself up and running. Interesting. With, with all this physicality and board game like elements, I wonder how this RPG is being received. Because like, I remember back when Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay went in a similar direction with cardboard counters, funky dice, card-based actions, progress trackers, and a box you kept your character in, and it had tear-off character sheets. Like, that was literally a thing. And the fans were up in arms. Like, like they were really upset. I thought it was awesome. I ran a three-year campaign with that system and thought it was amazing. But there were so many people who were like, ah, it's not an RPG anymore. It's a board game. Get off my lawn. And it was bad enough that Fantasy Flight actually re-release the game as a book-based experience with typical a dm's guide a player's guide and a monster manual to fit a popular theme but it was far too late 
because by that point, fans of and forget it, I'm going back to first edition or second edition, or this is when Zweehander hit the market, which was an OSR retro clone of Warhammer, and a bunch of fans moved to that. And I wonder how this one's being received. Now, Fantasy Flight did go on to create the Genesis system, which uses parts of that RPG system. So, but it, they still ditched all the cards. Like, it's not quite as physical as Warhammer was. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, now this isn't based on a, off an existing content, so you wouldn't be uh, luckily upsetting anyone who already loved the, the true thing. But uh, the concepts behind this one are really interesting. Like, there's a reason why you would want to buy that box. Um, okay. And uh, it's essentially a comic imprint. So everyone who buys a box is creating a world with it, with that mm. box. Uh, so everyone who plays and narrates with that box is helping build a comic book universe. So All right. in addition to the rule book, there's a setting book. And this is where before and during play, you build the world as a group through questions and prompts, narratively defining everything along the way. Uh, hmm. And if you want to run three teams through the same series, you can, and each team will impact the other teams through that collaborative world building. So once a question is asked hmm. and answered, it's there, it's set in stone, that is part of the world. Uh, so now it sounds like Gloomhaven <laughs> or, <laughs> or a legacy board game. No, absolutely. And in many ways it is. And it's, it's, but it's in, instead of a, a instead of a, a dungeon crawling world, it is, uh, you know, your super universe, your, your, your comic imprint, comic book imprint. I gotta say, that doesn't sound like something Deanna would like, though. She is really <laughs> not a fan of the shared world creation, and it sounds like that's a big part of this game. That that's is. almost the main part of this game, is making the world. Very much. Um, and on top of that, there's this fantastic character creation system. Uh, so while you have a, a character sheet and on a tear-off pad, that only records things like your name, some advancements, and a few of the narrative aspects of that character. Everything okay. else is done by cards, uh, randomly drawn and assembled in this game tray uh, to lay in, into a specific layout to get everything there in front of you. Now, there are optional rules if you don't want to make uh, a random character, but they do specify that that will take time because, again, you're basing this off of you know 290 cards. So if your your players are going to go shuffling through cards to find the right power, take a, do that on a different day. Don't try and do that when you're sitting down. Uh, if you want to sit down and play, though, shuffle your deck, deal out your powers, deal out your archetypes, deal out uh, things, and you're good to go. Now, do you do that every session? Like, do your powers change? Uh, you can. Uh, you can do it every session. You can keep characters through. Uh, okay. they, they even actually have, um, if you're, so if, if pl a player from group A is coming in and playing with group B, and those two characters share the same power, there's mm -hmm. only one card, but there are some uh, generic powers, sort of, that, okay. So you, the players have proxies. to agree. That, well, they have. You can do proxies, or the players can agree that. Well, in this game, I'm going to be powered down a little bit, and I'm going to use this oh, okay. instead of. Um, and only one person uses the card. So that's uh, that's interesting, and it's all just laid out really in a really interesting manner in the game tray. I'll have to do some pictures for uh, for the the blog post, I guess, to to show yeah. off these game trays. Um, and then finally, the publishers have printable copies of everything, should you run okay. out of any pages, and a digital care, uh, creator pack with art included so that you can build <laughs> your own series if you've managed to wow. completely exhaust the four series that come in the box. Now, is there any expansions for this, or is it too uh, new for that? It's, it's still pretty new and, well, COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, myself and probably many other people really haven't had a chance to get this in front of people yet. Uh, there is apparently a tabletop simulator version, um, <laughs> but I, and I, and I've, I've thought about discord, but it would probably require some serious character keeper magic and bot enabling in order to, uh, to get that going because of the randomness aspect. So uh, one, one really interesting use I thought of this one is again, as a con game, because if you bring your box to the con, you're bringing your comic book universe and allowing others into it. And then <laughs> every time at every con, more people, whether it was the same players wanting to jump in again or completely new people, would be helping, joining into this world and helping expand the world of your comic book imprint uh, as a group over you know years. That's very cool. That reminds me of Todd Crapper, uh, the man with the best name in gaming. 
is running his um oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the game. That's terrible. If I remember the name, but he he runs a con game, and what he has decided is that his con games are all in a continual universe. Right. And telling an ongoing story and the one thing that happens at one con will impact what's going on in the next con and will impact what's going on. high plane samurai thank you no one said that i'm thinking myself <laughs> I, I'm samurai myself. was in the back of my head i couldn't remember the high planes were high, high plane samurai really uh, a very modern narrative game with some rather unique ideas on narration and shared narration but anyway it was just the the concept of the ongoing con game it works really well for todd um, one of the things Todd's actually done is he has gotten a hold of myself and another person who played the same character and wants us to duel out because of that. <laughs> because where I went with the character was very different from where uh, Jason Pitt went with the character. He's like, I want you to like compete with each other. Like you're, you're from different worlds or something. But it sounds really cool. And I don't know, this one said, of all the games you mentioned tonight, this is the one I want to see. Like I want to, this sounds the most interesting to me again, as a fan of games with board game, like components and like in the back of my head as a, as a part-time game designer, I'm always fascinating by wanting to put board game elements in RPGs. And I keep thinking that you can do a bag builder as an RPG where the more skill you have, the more chips you can put in the bag or something. And I'm always fascinated to see how people have, um, physicalized or added physicality to role-playing games by using board game elements. And this sounds like a fantastic system for doing it. But what do you do with all those dice? Is it a dice pool system? Uh, it's 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 uh, mostly um, uh, actually uh, uh, yeah, percentile. Um, but then okay. there's, there's a few other different, there's, there's challenge dice and I was going to say, so, did you say it came with like 60 dice, 22 dice? Yeah. 22 dice. So there, there's, there's gotta be some kind of pool. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it's, 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 it's interesting. I, again, I haven't, and I, because I haven't gotten to the table, it's, it's been tough working through everything, yeah. but, uh, and, I, and a lot of it is going to be card driven, right? So unless you've got yeah. the right cards, you're never going to see what some of the dice will do. Yeah, and I can't see playing that one online, except, as you said, that there's a tabletopia with all the cards and all the physicality, maybe, yeah, but absolutely. like, oof, that's everyone needs their own box otherwise, and that's yeah, and that's and, probably and that not ruins, the way you want to do well, it. And that ruins part of the, the concept of it, uh, yeah. <laughs> again, because because of what it is, and it's not, I mean, it's not an inexpensive box either, so. Right. So that was Spectaculars from Scratchpad Publishing. Actually, app name, is this their first game? Because uh, the go. whole scratch pad publishing makes me think they that do, they like the they whole have pad a, thing. Uh, a a um, another game, maybe in the lobby, I'll check it out. There's a there's a, I right. believe it's an older uh, a western style game that they have. I just wonder again yeah. if it's using that flip pad scratch pad idea just because it's in their could name. Very, could very well that be. might be their their meme. Well, that's it for my list of what's new and or interesting in the world of superhero RPGs. <laughs> We're gonna head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has questions. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate the uh, the the love from the chat room. Uh, you know, on on my my first official ask. There you go. <laughs> I think it did well. You're going to put me out of business here. So, uh, what did you guys think of the list of uh, super RPGs? I'm actually going to step back here and grab Spectaculars and show off a couple of bits. All right. So, what I want to know from the chat, we're going to scroll up, and unfortunately, I see a bunch of comments, but I don't know what we were talking about at the time people commented. So. Um, we're going to address those, but what I want to know is, did Sean mention your personal favorite? And more importantly, is there a supers game you think Sean should check out? Now, personally, the big ones I see missing here are the big games, like the big well-known games. Uh, and my favorite superhero game of all time now is Marvel Heroic Role-Playing from Margaret Weas Productions when they, for a very limited time, had the Marvel license Delicious. and lost it. Because Disney decided they were going to start doing some movies or something, so they needed all the Marvel licenses back. And while well, you all know how well that turned out for them. Um, so the RPG died. That was my favorite system that had a very unique twist of you rolled a dice pool that you built based on your powers. And then when you rolled, you chose two of the dice, which was really neat. So you got to choose your amount of effect in your effort. And all that mattered for the effect, so how big the bang was, was the size of the die. 
Whereas the effect was based on how high you rolled. So like your D20 might have gave you the highest number, but you really, well, so there were no D20s. Your D12 might have gave you the highest number, but you probably want to use that D12 for effect. So you may end right. up having to use your DA. It was a neat system. So that's one I think Sean should check out. Another one that I actually gave to Sean to check out <laughs> is a fate-based game called Base Raiders, which is someone actually trying to mash supers with D&D, &D, but throwing out the mechanics. So it is super hero dungeon crawling. And it's all about dungeon crawling with superheroes. So another one I saw, I'd like to, uh, Sean to check out. And like I said, I actually lent him my copy to check out. And the other one is Sentinel Comics, but like I've got my sealed copy here. So I can't say much about that, but I have played that at cons under the awesome Eric Paquette. And it's like a simplified version of that Marvel heroic system based on the Sentinels of the multi-first universe, which is now big enough that it's like it doesn't rival marvel or dc but like there's enough so you can buy sentinel comics and there's a storyline yeah oh we have eric oh we wow got, we have eric in the chat room Yay wow i had no comics. clue eric was in wow. the chat room that's Excellent. awesome uh major kill is mentioning uh mutants masterminds marvel phase rip masks yep. and icons and i actually just downloaded my copy of phase rip the the open free version yep uh, just the other day, so that is one. I mean, it's not like I don't know about it, but I'm interested in seeing what these new open, uh, you know, serial numbers scraped off, no longer Marvel mm -hmm. versions are doing. They are crunchy. Um, you know, building out your 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 uh, phase rip stats with uh, you know anything from six to 160 based on your your power level, basically. Yeah, I, I love. Did you ever play Marvel back when I, I was never playing? played? See, Marvel I think with that you. I think we reconnected. Yeah. after my marvel days yep so i'm gonna scroll back through the chat here see what we got um there's our starting uh well mountain pop is asking if t about teen titans and yes teen titans is yes. absolutely one of the masks uh inspirations teen titans and and young young justice are, yes. are sort of the two key <laughs> yeah I, for, I always forget deanna was a big teen titans fan i did not i i was uh kind of like sean doesn't do uh shadow run games with elves he might, likes his cyberpunk pure. For many years, I was a Marvel only fan. I was not a DC fan. Deanna, on that, the other hand, was a huge DC fan. So she was the one that was into that. Um, Ryan asked about overpower. Was that trying to remember? Uh, I think that was the, uh, the palladium. About the palladium. See, I think name. champions is champions the palladium. Is the palladium name, yeah. And, and, and I am right. not, and I am not a, a a a fan of palladium. So I will yeah. probably politely. Not even take not a look to, at that. Not one. to look at those. Um, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't discuss uh, uh, Todd's game. Um, I don't know if I'm aware of Pandora superhero RPG. I'll have to look into that. Uh, that is that is currently on Kickstarter. Ah, okay. that is Todd. We we did bring up Todd Crapper, and I we talked did. a bit about <laughs> one of his games, but I did not mention that one. Yeah, Todd currently has Pandora up on um, up on Kickstarter right now. Oh, I'll have to take a look at that. Uh, so Brian made a game comment game. about Mass being not only a very good supers game, but it's a better powered by the Apocalypse games than any others he's played. So it's his favorite PBTA game thus far. Pandora, I don't know if I would go that far. Destruction is that the one? I think so. Yeah, Sounds it looks right. Like a game of overpowered broken ruler games. Great evil. All right. Yep. Excellent. There you go. We got one new one for Sean. Anyone got any more? Uh, yeah, Heroes Unlimited is the Palladium. There we go. Okay. Oh, that's the plan. See, I was trying to... There Champion, we go. And Champions is Hero. There we go. Yeah, is Champions is system. one I, I do a plan on on grabbing and looking at. Uh, Heroes Unlimited is the one I will probably bow out politely by. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, there are probably at least five or six other games in my RPG directory that I just didn't get to because they oh, yeah. often share a lot of similar concepts or, or weren't as interesting or diverse as mm -hmm. the ones we covered today. Yeah, the goal today was to talk about how systems do things unique. There, I'm sure there's other D20 systems, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So uh, someone noted that I probably would have had a better time play playing a Super RPG instead of going to prom. Uh, <laughs> potentially. Like, we did it. <laughs> they, they played one song that I thought was acceptable to dance to, and we danced. That was nice. Then we went to an after party. That part was good. Uh, except I tried to do a stomach trick, and that did bad things with the beer. Uh, so math guy Dave is mentioning he listened to an actual play. They quit after one session. I that am was, guessing that's that mutants and masterminds. Masterminds, yes. All right. Um, not not really at all surprising there. Um, Brian saying this exactly this. If I remember correctly, that's when I was uh, somewhat ranting about forcing settings into the D twenty system. 
Um, give them all the cones was a comment about David Oakham's miniature game. And I just dropped the link to the Pandora game in the uh, chat room there you there for Thank anyone you. who wants to take a look as I back the registered super, super level right now. Uh, <laughs> there you go. It's done. Yep. Sold. <laughs> Eric, you, you better tell uh, yeah, yeah, Todd yeah. he owes you. Yeah, yeah. Let, let Todd know that uh, you, you deserve a uh, Yeah, you, do, you deserve that. a kickback on that one. Um, so Mountain Papa is not a role-playing player, but really enjoyed the topic. So that's awesome. Brian also really enjoyed the topic and the range of games. Uh, Math Guy Dave was most interested in Spectaculars. Yeah, and Spectaculars is really an interesting system. Again, because of the flexibility of it is, and, and that that shared universe you're building, it's real, as well as, I mean, I bought it because of the cards. I At the, at the time, yeah. I'm like, oh, supers and cards, I'm in. Uh, but then once I got into seeing the, the way the narrative is built, and the fact that you're recording the narrative in their own books, in their setting book, um, it's like so. This is this is the the, the scratch pad for uh, one of their series, right? And it's just and it's literally you know front and oh, back okay. pages. I of, thought there was more improv on theirs. Okay, so well, there, there's there's more detail. Like there is well, improv, but I, well, they, there's they, a lot they, more guidance there than I thought. These are questions. So this is yeah. this is they're all they're all they're all sort of multiple choice okay. questions involved. Um, cool. And then the setting book, uh, you know, you've got here is, so it's like, what's the name of your city? What's your city nickname? And then they've got, you know, what makes your city different from every other city? Oh, it's definitely a legacy things. game. You're going to write in the book. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, you know, every page has a question about truths. So, you, so, you know, Seems cool. as well as all the, as well as filling in all the questions, you get to uh, enter truths about your city that are going to be he a fact for, uh, you know, evermore in the world. So yeah, so Eric asked about uh, Todd Crapper's RPG. I, these were games Sean already has. So yeah. one of the reasons we didn't mention Todd's game is we haven't seen it yet. Yeah. A uh, City of Mist is popular. I've definitely seen that, but I know nothing about it except I've seen that before. Um, <laughs> and she games makes uh, Deanna cringe. That's the cartoon, though. You used to like the uh, the actual comics from what I remember. New Teen Titans and Teen Titans and whatever. Yeah, and Deanna like both. I now I like both. I, I will happily read either. Um icons. I've definitely seen icons. I own a copy. I, That's I, my problem. Is I own probably all of these, but yeah. <laughs> I haven't actually sat down and read them. Uh I do I do own a, a, a selection of icons content. I haven't uh, I got the icons assembled version, which is their recent sort of mashup of everything and, and re release of it. Yeah. Um but I mean, I've got I've got some kids stuff that I didn't talk about. There's there's uh, wearing the cape, which is a uh, a very kids oriented game. Brian might actually be interested in, in that one. Again, it's wearing the cape, the role playing game. That's an um, interesting one. Is in so there. sorry, I guess, I guess I worded something wrong. Uh, and she games doesn't make Deanna <laughs> cringe. Uh, she's Modern not playing Teen Dream Titans Park. Makes Deanna yes. cringe. Like, Modern Teen Titans cartoons. <laughs> Dave, make... Dave saw my tweet. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, and Sean back Pandora. So there you go. You're welcome, Todd. I don't think Todd tunes into the show, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Todd's an awesome guy. So uh, yeah, there's there, and like one of the other things that's out there that's fantastic. And and if you are running superhero games, one of the the tough things if if you like me aren't running uh, pre written adventures is just making sure you've got the ins inspiration on a day to day basis to keep a, a fun, fresh villain of the week going as well as you know overarching plots and one of the things that's really helped me is going and grabbing different source books on drive through rpg even if i'm never going to play i uh, the system mm -hmm. the interesting uh content they put out is fantastic although i have to say not all of it um <laughs> i picked up um i picked up one game and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bash on them but uh okay. i picked up a game a, a system and it was a source book uh all about heroes and villains and it was it was very um robust a, a a significantly thick book until i got to it and realized that it was literally marvel with the serial numbers scraped off mm. uh and i mean i don't think there was a single original character in the entire book of, that's too bad i mean 200 plus pages but it, I, you know, I could literally trace the a direct line from every character they listed to their alternate in the real existing comic book world. Yeah, fair. And that one, that one was a was an unfortunate uh, 
purchase on my farm. But a lot of these are, you know, you'll get these little interesting concepts and someone will just have, you know, they they played something and, and they created some interesting NPC that had a couple of quirks uh, and, and the, threw that into their game book. And that's just something that's fantastic mm -hmm. to grab on and run with in your own direction. 